Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, Dr. Casey, it's my pleasure to give you a quick update on the Swift Creek Reservoir. Uh, in today's presentation, we're going to go on, uh, we're going to discuss information on hydrilla. We'll talk a little bit about the hydrilla monitoring and control program. I also would like to show you slide by side, uh, side by side comparison of hydrilla growth between last year, 2020, and this year, 2021. Uh, also talk a little bit about the water quality in the reservoir this year, as well as uh, do a quick review of the overall hydrilla growth from the time we first identified a hydrilla in reservoir in 2009 to today, and some updates we're going to have to our modeling. So a little information on hydrilla. What is hydrilla? Uh, hydrilla is a non-native invasive uh, plant. It's indigenous to Asia and Africa. Uh, it's called a submerged macrophyte. It actually um, first appeared in the United States in the 1950s. It was actually intentionally imported uh, to Florida to be used in aquarium, uh, aquariums for uh, uh, fish. Um, early on, when aquariums were disposed in the Florida waterways, it quickly made its way through the Florida waterways and expanded throughout the United States. And it is now common and pervasive in lakes throughout the US. You can see on this map the distribution in the southeast. By the 1990s, the United States was spending millions of dollars on trying to control this uh, aquatic weed, and um, I've read literature where they can now find it as far north as Canada. Hydrilla is an aquatic plant that forms dense mats that can adversely affect all uses of water bodies, uh, and we do have it in the Swift Creek Reservoir. It's extremely rapid growth. It can grow an inch a day. Each stem on the hydrilla can grow up to 28 feet long. Um, it is highly dependent. Uh, its growth is highly dependent on the water, on sunlight and water clarity in reservoirs. So in the Swift Creek Reservoir, uh, we typically see it in water shallower than 10 feet. It also can be transported from one waterway to the other with fragmentation that gets caught on boats if it's not properly cleaned. And we do believe that's how it came to the Swift Creek Reservoir. Hydrilla has numerous ways to reproduce. It can re reproduce by seed, torions, uh, tubers and vegetative fragmentation. The seeds actually can overwinter and they can randomly generate throughout the year and create new plants. Torions are flower-like structures on the, on the weed that actually can drop off and create a new plant. Tubers are potato-like structures in the root structure of the plant that actually can germinate and create a new plant. And then um, last but not least is vegetative fragmentation where if you were to cut the plant up into a thousand pieces, each one of those pieces can actually reroute and start a new plant. So a uh, very aggressive uh, plant. With the hydrilla monitoring and control program, just going to go over some highlights. We first identified hydrilla in the Swift Creek Reservoir in 2009. We hired a certified uh, lake manager, Dr. Wagner, who has been doing this for 35 years now, um, to guide us on uh, looking at different ways to control hydrilla. The use of triploid grass carp was determined to be the most cost-effective and environmentally friendly way to control hydrilla in our reservoir. Um, triploid refers to the chromosome makeup on the fish, and it basically means the fish are sterile. Um, so we go through a number of exercises th exercise throughout the year uh, for carp stocking, which is a key component of our program. Uh, every year, we, we, uh, we gather a lot of data on the reservoir, not only the hydrilla growth, but the water quality, algal blooms. We do uh, fish surveys. We gather all that data, we send it off to Dr. Wagner, and he actually compiles an annual report. He also has developed a carp and hydrilla bio, uh, uh, biomass model. And what that model does, it takes a lot of this input of all the data we collect throughout the year and tries to predict uh, what a good number of carp introduction would be the next year to continue control on hydrilla. This annual report and the stocking recommendations are shared with the Reservoir Hydrilla Management Group and then also shared with the community, and it's immediately posted to our website for public input. One thing that we've determined over the years, and it's a consensus not only by utilities, Dr. Wagner and the public and the Reservoir Hydrilla Management Group, is that we found it most effective if we introduce a smaller number of carp, uh, but on a more frequent basis to control hydrilla. We have more predictable, predictable outcomes if we do that. That's called multiple classes of carp. It, na it uh, mimics the natural reproduction process of the carp because they are sterile. You have to restock to, to increase the numbers. And we basically, um, it, it decreases the likelihood of a sharp drop off of uh, control in hydrilla. Another important component of the program is the Department of Wildlife and Resources, which was formerly um, Department of Game and Inland Fisheries. They actually have to permit the carp to come into Virginia because they're also an invasive species. And that's one reason why they're sterile. One of the challenges is that not only do we um, recommend what carp have to, the number of carp to add, um, Department of Wildlife Resources has to not only approve the number, but then also approve the um, number of fish that come, uh, that come into the reservoir that we recommend. 
So in the next few slides, um, I'm going to compare our monthly growth comparisons from 2020, which was a typical uh, control year, to 2021, where we had excessive growth. Uh, it's hard to see the legend, so I blew it up on this slide for you. There's four growth categories. Blue is no growth, and then we have um, shades of green from light, medium, to heavy growth. The darker the green would be the darker density uh, in that area on the map. As you can see on this map, in April is the start of our growing season. If we had a successful uh, winter die-off of the hydrilla um, due to the cold temperatures, typically in April we don't see any hydrilla growth, which was the case for both 2020 and 2021. Starting in May is typical for us to see hydrilla growth. You can see on this chart that May we had about 40 more acres than we did the previous year, and that continued through June, uh, July, uh, and you can see the rate of growth this year was drastically more than, than the previous years. I stop on this slide because July is quite interesting. If you look at the color on the map, July this year was actually uh, had a decent footprint, about 150 more acres than uh, the previous July, but the densities were very low. They're very, very light color. Um, not receiving a lot of phone calls from customers at this point because the growth was extremely light, even though the footprint was a little larger. But I'd like you to keep your eye on the July 2021 map as I switch to August, because the densities drastically increase. So from July to August, um, the densities, not only the footprint increased, but the densities increased. So on our model, one of the things we look at is biomass. And biomass, it looks at not only the footprint of the hydrilla, but also the densities to try to figure out what the total mass of the hydrilla is. The biomass increased three times in that 30-day period. And as uh, two of the board members know, the phone started ringing in August um, because mm -hmm. we saw that drastic expansion in that one month. September is typically our largest peak month. It was in 2020, um, and we anticipate it to be um, with the warmer weather continuing. We anticipate September we're going to see a, a larger increase and a more dense footprint. Once we receive that data, we do surveys on the reservoir. We immediately post it to the website so that uh, the public can see it and consume it and give us feedback, um, and we will post it to our website. As far as turbidity, excuse me, as far as raw water quality in the reservoir, this year has actually been exceptional for water quality. Um, we've had much clearer water, and if you speak to anybody that regularly goes in the reservoir, they'll tell you they have never seen the reservoir this clear. And that's really demonstrated by our lower turbidities, our lower suspended solids, and our higher secchi depth readings. And that clarity, water clarity, continued throughout the entire summer. We also, with the increased uh, water quality, we actually saw an improvement in ease to treat the water at a, our, at a water plant. Our filter run times were a lot longer. Um, one of the things that we noticed is with the clearer water, not only hydrilla, but all the plant species actually were booming this year. Um, and hydrilla being so light, dependent, and dominant really had an opportunity to take over because the water was so clear. We actually had no algal blooms this year that we had addressed. Typically in a year, we might have one or two algal blooms in the reservoir that we can treat with copper sulfate or PAX, which is a peroxide mm -hmm. product in the raw water. We didn't have one episode of that because the water quality and clarity was so good in the reservoir. The next slide is my last slide, and it's a lot of information in this slide. It goes actually from 2009 to current on how we track hydrilla. On the x-axis, you see the year. On the y-axis, you see the acres of hydrilla, and then we have that, that density also plotted. The red, um, the red arrows show when we introduced um, the carp, and in the red boxes, you can see the number of carp we introduced each time. There's two things I want to point out that really stand out to me on this slide. The first thing is, and it's a lesson learned, is that if you introduce too much carp, you can have a collapse not only of hydrilla, but all the plant communities, which is not healthy for the reservoir. So you can see after 2011, because we introduced too many carp, we actually had a complete collapse of the plant uh, biolife in the reservoir, which is not a healthy condition to have. The biggest concern is you're, you have factors that can contribute to increased algal blooms, and algal blooms can actually be much worse than a hydrilla. Everybody doesn't like a hydrilla, but algal blooms, blooms can be much worse from a water quality standpoint. Uh, algal blooms, as they decay, they give off an extremely foul odor. Um, you can Google it and, and see the challenge they can have. We were very fortunate we were able to get through that three-year time period without it, but you can see as we were adding carp, we had these ups and downs of, you know, uh, you know, fasting and f famine and feast of, of the hydrilla. And so in 2018, we actually came out with that concept of um, multiple classes of carp, smaller addition, more frequently. And as you can see, from 2018 to 2020, it was working. Um, we needed to add probably a little more carp than what the model was showing us to get the numbers down, but it, but it was working. We were getting a more consistent outcome. 
something changed in August of 2020. And, and if you can see, if you look at April 2020, we added 600 carb, and then in April 2021, we doubled that, but still had no appreciable impact on the hydrilla. And from the data we're reviewing, what happened is the flood of August 15, 2020, where we had three feet going over the reservoir, we knew when we were gonna add carp in 2021, we had an, a certain higher escape rate of the fish over that dam. There's no way we didn't. Um, we talked with the experts and tried to figure out, take an educated guess on how many fish escaped the reservoir because that impacts the model. Normally our mortality rate, which includes an escape rate in the model is 20%. We increased that to 30%. Clearly by the data we're seeing today, that, that mortality rate is much higher than we anticipated. The second thing that the flood did is that it removed nutrient-rich sediment from the reservoir. And that's one of the reasons we think we're seeing an increased clarity and better water quality in the reservoir, not having algae issues and things like that. But again, a positive thing that the water quality improved, but a negative thing that the clarity improved from a, from a plant growth because now the, the light is getting in to a further depth. I think the light is getting even a half a feet deeper than it typically does on a, a standard year from the Secchi depth readings, which would, would also um, increase be a reason why the uh, hydrilla increased. So moving forward, our plans are to calibrate the model. And again, we're gonna consult with Dr. Wagner, but the one thing we would do is we calibrate that mortality rate so the model predicts what we actually saw in 2021. So what we anticipate is that mortality rate is gonna increase, increase, increase until we can predict what actually happened. Then we'll have a good idea what the actual uh, loss of fish rate was. And what that'll do is that will, um, require additional carp stockings, a higher number of carp stockings. We have to be very careful on lessons learned and not adding too many fish where we have a collapse of the plant community. Last thing I'll leave with you on the hydrilla is that I've been extremely active with the Reservoir Hydrilla Management Group. Those are representatives from the communities around the reservoir that have an interest in it. Uh, we're very active this week. We actually um, are engaging the Brandon Mill Community Association and Woodlake Community Associations. I know those, those groups are. They're having conversations about secondary controls, whether they be benthic barriers or harvesting in the reservoir. And uh, I know Brandon Mill has interest now in spending some money on, on focusing on maybe some community boating lanes. Woodlake actually, there's um, just found out this week, there's a group of homeowners that went out and bought a hydrilla cutter, hooked it up to their um, pontoon boat, and actually were successful in creating a boating lane for their small, small community. We have our reservoir hydrilla management group rep out there documenting this and how much effort it's taking so that we can uh, take that uh, lessons learned and the education from that and share it with the community. That does conclude my hydrilla presentation. I have um, a couple of, Mr. Chairman, if it's okay, I have a couple of um, more slides I wanna go through very quickly. Um, to a, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman, to address some various questions and concerns from citizens, and I'll do that very quickly, then I'll open it up to uh, any questions that you have. Uh, every so often, the board administration, you will get some claims or, or questions from citizens, and we felt it was important to bring those out and discuss them publicly so we have a more informed public, because sometimes we have the same questions asked multiple times. Um, we recently, in mid-August, got a claim concern that um, Chesterfield County's water delivery system is overtaxed and we discharged in the James River five times in a two week period. I can tell you when that, that claim first came to me, I was a little taken back because I know we have a fairly tight uh, sanitary sewer system. Um, this is one of 100 performance measures we have on our website that we utilize to maintain our best in class utility. And what this is, this really tells you it's an indicator of health and design of our sanitary sewer system, how it's designed, our collection system, and how it's maintained. And what it is, is, is the number of reportable sanitary sewer overflows per 100 miles of sanitary sewer over a year period. This is an industry standard. The industry standard is four per 100 miles over the year. We set our goal at two, half the industry standard. And you can see by our performance, we're at 0 0.7, so about six times lower than the industry standard or actual performance. And this, again, this is just one of 100 performance measures that we have on our website that the public can check. Um, so we knew, looking at the records, it wasn't us that discharged the river, but a quick Google search did find an article from the Richmond Times-Dispatch on August 6th that there was, in fact, five discharges in a 10-day period from the, um, from the river. The article by the Times-Dispatch was accurate, and it didn't mention Chesterfield County, so we weren't involved in those discharges. So again, it just uh, might have been some confusion by the, by the citizen. Another concern we also got is that, that uh, a concern on the impacts to the utility system be if developers don't pay cash proffers. And so just to clarify to the public, public cash proffers were never intended uh, to be used or were never used for utility system expansion. How it works in Chesterfield County is that if a developer wants to develop a certain piece of land, they actually pay for and install the utilities, 
We'll send out our inspectors to make sure it's installed to our standard. When it's complete and it's acceptable to us, we actually will have it donated to the utility system. We take it into our fixed asset system and we operate and maintain that facility. In addition to that, the builders will actually pay connection fees to the new homes to pay to buy in capacity into our system. And what that does, we consider that expansion money and that goes towards the expansion of our water and wastewater facility. So in Chesterfield County, development pays for development. We also so had that's, a that's important real quick. So there's not an individual profit because they pay 100% of the cost of additional utilities for their development, correct? Yes, that's correct, correct Mr. Engel. Uh, another claim that we had is that uh, the Chesterfield system has more water than it can handle, and again, we assume this was wastewater and um, has not, hasn't had the system upgraded in 50 years. Well, we already went through the wastewater collection system that it's adequately sized and maintained. You can saw that performance measure. We took a look at our wastewater plants. We have two wastewater plants. Proctor's Creek is at 27 million gallons a day. Our, excuse me, Falling Creek is at 12 million gallons a day. Our five-year average flow is nine. And you can see Proctor's Creek at 27 with a five-year at 16 MGD. So again, well below any permitted capacity. You know, in my opinion, we're very aggressive on planning for the future. We actually are planning a, a expansion of the Proctor's Creek plant from 27 million gallons a day at 54. That's actually 90 years of capacity for our future customers, and we have that in the design phase right now, the first phases of that. Uh, so again, very aggressive in ensuring we have capacity at our facilities. As far as not investing in our utility system, uh, because of this board, we've actually invested $166 million over the last 10 years in our utility system, and that was just 10 years, not the 50 years that was mentioned. So again, just wanted to get um, some clear information out there. We do have, we had a concern on lead in the drinking water. Uh, again, all these topics and this topic are hot topics in the national media, lead especially ever since Flint, Michigan. Um, it's important to understand that we have a fairly young system and we don't have the same challenges as some of the older cities have with lead. It's a true challenge for some municipalities. Chesterfield is young and we just don't have those challenges. Another thing that's very important about lead is that lead typically doesn't come from water source or treatment plants. It comes from either piping or plumbing. So years ago in the 40s, they may have put lead service lines in, um, and they also, um, you might have in homes built prior to 1986, lead in copper, uh, in the solder, in the copper piping and things like that. So that's where lead comes, is from the piping. So, but we have no known lead water service lines in Chesterfield County, so none no known lead service line in Chesterfield. We're just too young. Years ago, if, if there were lead, it got replaced uh, in a timely manner like we replaced all our assets in a timely manner. In addition to not having any lead service lines, we take a proactive approach to our water treatment. There's two things as far as lead that we do. For corrosion cro control, we actually add a chemical called orthophosphate, which actually uh, is a con corrosion control, actually coats the inside of the pipe. So if we do have customers that have uh, lead, um, lead solder uh, in their homes, this actually will coat the pipe so that the lead doesn't leach out. The second thing we do with water treatment is make sure the pH is properly adjusted so that we don't have corrosive water. And our, and our water quality testing, decades of water quality testing, really show that that's the case, that it's not an issue. We actually started out our lead monitoring de decades ago and uh, we were testing the water every six months. VDH actually put us on reduced monitoring because the values are so low. We also on our website have our annual quarter quality report. There's an excerpt here you can see on each of our supplies, there's an ND. Uh, the last time we tested for lead, it was actually a non-detect on every single sample we took in the system, just to, to um, let you know. The last concern we had is on utility rates uh, mm -hmm. are not affordable. There was also a proposal for the state to take over Chesterfield Utilities. Uh, we're very transparent with our rates to the public. This is a very slide you sh you're very used to in our budget presentations. An average residential customer uses seven CCF, just under 5,000 gallons. And you can see we're very competitive in the region. Uh, nationally, EPA actually has a affordable affordability um, calculation for municipalities. And what EPA says that is if a municipality has uh, a rate, uh, their utility rates over a year, water and wastewater, is anywhere from two to two and a half percent of the, uh, the, of the median household income, it's considered affordable. If you do the math calculation for Chesterfield, that comes out to 0.86. So we actually could double our rates in Chesterfield and EPA would consider, still consider our rates affordable. And that just gives you an idea of how we compare on the national level. Uh, as far as the state taking over utilities, I frequently get calls from VDH. They do not have the resources to take over utilities. We're extremely fortunate in Chesterfield County to have the resources and the talent we have. And I'll, I often get called upon uh, to help out smaller utilities that don't have the resources that Chesterfield has. And we're glad to do that, uh, to help out other utilities. One option, so you can't go to the state, what would the other option be? The other option would be to privatize. 
Private companies do an exceptional job on delivering good customer service and water quality. The challenge you have with privatizing is that it typically costs more because there's a profit, profit margin in the private sector. So what we did here is we went ahead and took that slide and included a local private water company on the right hand of the slide and included their rates compared to Chesterfield counties for the same volume of water, just to give you an idea how we compare to the private sector for transparency to the public. And that concludes my presentation. I would be more than happy to take any questions you have on Idrilla or any other questions. Th thanks, uh, George, for answering those questions. Dr. Casey, comment? Yeah, I just want to reiterate four, four points. And, and amazingly, I don't think George uttered the triple, triple A bond rating, which we would not have if, you, if he didn't just go through those last 10, 15 minutes of all those things that shore up a system. Um, you, you started the day with an Employee Excellence Award, so it, it starts there all the way to the top of, of George Hayes. And, uh, and George is recognized as a leader, not just in Chesterfield, not just the region, uh, but the state. I, I think he's actually gonna be president of the Professional Association of All Utility Operators uh, in, in this next year. So it, you can just tell that this is a person who knows the business, but also, it also knows the business of customer service and, and I've been CC'd on many emails that citizens send. Sometimes they send them to you that you forward to George. Morning, noon, night, and weekends. His response is, is, is probably the most detailed response is that gives the customer satisfaction that, that their question was heard and responded to professionally. So I just wanted to put those accolades on top of Mr. Hayes because he wouldn't otherwise say them himself. Thank you. Board members, any comments or questions? Mr. Chairman. Um, Thank you, Mr. Hayes, a, a great presentation. And I think uh, for those of our folks who live on a reservoir, it's important for them to understand uh, carp are generally on the surface, right? They generally swim toward the surface. They're not, they don't go down into the depths too much. And certainly um, uh, that's their, their natural habitat is to be on top. So I, one of the questions I wanted to ask was, do based on the model that um, we had uh, and then looking at the growth in August, are we able to determine what the actual mortality rate was of the carp? Uh, or if Dr. Wagner, was he, was he able to estimate what the actual mortality rate was? Well, I know we estimated 30%, but what did he, what does he think it was? So what we have to do is wait until we have all the data to make that determination. So we still have September data to go. That's typically the peak month. And so we don't want to uh, estimate that mortality rate too soon and be low. So we'd like to collect all the data and then um, input that into the model to try to determine uh, what the accurate mortality rate was. One of the things I remember him saying in a presentation at the uh, Hydrilla uh, management group was that the, these carp are not uh, migrant labor and you can't <laughs> sort of point them in a direction. And so uh, I know it's, it's, a, um, it's a situation where there's um, you know, only so much that they can eat and you can't control where they're eating. Um, so, I, you know, I know there's a lot of interest in this topic. I'm probably fielding uh, three or four calls a week. And I think there's interest in the threshing. Uh, and I know that's sort of an annual topic around this time and then it maybe seems to go away. But uh, one of the things I would like to explore with you is... Um, looking nationally at ways to um, bring that here uh, to some and, and maybe maybe make it easier for the HOAs to uh, to purchase those in some fashion or or to bring them here we I feel like we've got to have some kind of a standby so that people can get out and um, uh, get around uh, to the extent we uh, we feel comfortable doing that. I think one of the things we have to always be mindful of is that the county's interest in the reservoir really extends only to drinking water. So uh, at the same time, um, want to be sensitive to the residents' needs. A absolutely, Ms. Winslow, and you're absolutely correct. And that's why we have a seat on the sure. Reservoir Hydrilla Management Group, and we actually utilize our expertise in our staff and utilities department to support them. The harvesting that went on in the past week, we fully support and we, we help. You know, sometimes homeowners are not going to be able to be able to um, uh, navigate that regulatory challenge and that hurdle that you have to have. So I view my role as to assist them, um, you know, with that regulatory challenge with our expertise and in-house staff to be successful in what they're trying to do. Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Carroll. Quick question. So um, two things. One, some people have suggested uh, a different type of fish 
Uh, and some of the research that I've looked at basically said you don't want to introduce uh, freshwater tilapia in here because they're even more of an invasive species uh, than the carp. And I also encourage people who are fishing in the reservoir, please don't catch the carp. Uh, we want to keep them alive and, and, uh, and doing their job. The question I have, though, is if you, um, what's it called, flesh, when they cut it? Oh, harvest. When they harvest, right? So are they actually pulling the material out of the lake when they do that, or are they leaving it in there? So we actually had that conversation, and we, we observed, we sent our staff out to observe them, and they were trying to collect the hydrilla as best they could. In, in, in the reservoir conditions right now, it's not going to make much of a difference if some of it gets away, but we recommend that they collect as much of that hydrilla as they can, double bag it, and bring it to the landfill. Yeah, because I was going to say, if you leave it in there, potentially it could seed itself again somewhere else if it floated away from where it was cut, and then we'd have even a bigger problem. That's correct, sir. The other concern we have, we start receiving complaints of dead hydrilla washing up on the resident shorelines, um, and we don't want that either. And isn't it true that the dead hydrilla, um, or any dead plants for that matter, can affect the water quality? And that's why we have to be careful at how we actually uh, take, take this out, so to speak, because uh, the rotting material in the water could affect our ability to keep the water clean? That's exactly right. Um, dead hydrilla will consume oxygen in the water column, which will impact uh, aquatic life. And that's one of the concerns. It also will degrade the water quality uh, and it'll make it more difficult for us to treat. We'll also see higher filter run times if you get a lot of organic material coming to the plant. So for all those reasons, you know, we try to take this proactive approach in utilities to protect the reservoir as a long-term water supply. We totally understand, you know, there's, there's other uses besides a water supply for the reservoir, and that's why we're actively involved in the reservoir hydro drill management group and do as much as we can to assist them on their needs for aesthetics and also boating and recreation. Well, I think my colleague has a good idea, and that is that we should, uh, I guess, look across the country to other states that are having the same problem. I'm sure we've probably done it already, but who knows? Someone may come up with a better idea and look at some inventive ways that we might be able to assist with not just uh, getting a couple more thousand carp next year, which is what it looks like we're going to do, but also find other ways that they may be finding solutions to mitigate this. But great presentation. Appreciate you being here, and uh, keep up the great work. Great. Thank you, Mr. Any other comments? Yes, Mr. Engel. Did you say if they uh, were to harvest it in a way that cut it up into small pieces that that would actually cause it to grow at yeah, a, yeah, a so greater rate? So are we giving good advice to people that are trying to harvest it or maybe go down <laughs> on the water's edge and maybe they think a weed eater or something is the right thing to use and letting them know that that's going to cause them more problems? Yes, and we are educating them about uh, vegetative fragmentation and to collect it, bag it, bring it to the landfill. Something that really impressed me is in the beginning in 2009, I've been in involved in this starting off as an assistant director in the public meetings. There was a lot of confusion about hydrilla. I think we've done a decent job over the years. There'll be people in the audience um, giving me information uh, you know, that we've passed out over the years. So I think for the most part, people understand that it, vegetative fragmentation can happen, and that's why, without even asking, we saw them trying to collect the hydrilla and trying to do the right thing. And the other question I have is, uh, I won't pin you down on where it would go exactly, but if the state was to <laughs> run utilities, what do you think that would do to the average bill of our citizens? Well, the thing is, the state doesn't have the resources that we do, and um, even the smallest, even the smallest challenge they have with some of the smaller utilities. And as Dr. Casey mentioned, I belong to a couple of professional organizations. Through the professional organizations, and Chesterfield is very well respected in the in the in the state and the nation. Um, we'll actually get calls for assistance from some of the smaller utilities that just don't have the resources that we do. We're very fortunate in Chesterfield. But it's highly likely that they would try to use. Uh, some of the localities that are more efficient to raise their rates so that they could offset that somewhere else in the state, isn't it? Yeah, I, I could see that possibility, sir. Let's hope not, Ms. Haley. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think one of the things, George, that, that's so important for our citizens to realize is that the, the way you folks reinvest in infrastructure is so critically important to the whole functionality of the system, the fact that you know, we have plans, you folks have plans to continue to maintain the existing, you know, utility infrastructure, which, you know, I can tell you it's exactly what we see happening in neighboring jurisdictions where there's constantly issues 
with whether it be sewage leakage or whether it be water line breakings and things like that. So I think that that is a really critical piece um, of information for folks to focus on to recognize that's why we don't have the problems we have at the extent that other, you know, other jurisdictions do, why we don't have the same impact to have to keep up with. And, you know, I, I've been incredibly impressed since I've been on this board to learn more and more every time you speak about, you know, how our utility department works and how that reinvestment is so critically important to, again, ensuring the quality, ensuring the rate structure we have, like all of those things work collaboratively and work together, besides the incredible team of folks you have, because you do. And I think we've all had an opportunity to witness that firsthand, seeing them in our neighborhood, seeing them around our folks, day, night, freezing cold, whenever that is. And so thank you 